So hi everyone. Uh, we have one more uh, webinar today. Um, today, Spiros from our team, CERN Cloud team, will talk about uh, some of the details on containerization and container images and some of the best practices that can be followed. Um, as usual, if you have questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand during the presentation or just leave a question on the Q&A box and uh, we'll, we'll handle it. Um, and also we will have a Q&A session at the end. So go ahead, Spurs. Okay, uh, hello from me as well. Um, I will talk about the how containers and uh, images work and I will present some best practices and then running a simple, a simple application uh, on Kubernetes. So um, I will start uh, with the motivation. So usually it goes like this. So I'm a developer, I have an application and I want to develop it and uh, run it somewhere. Um, my application could be written in a programming language like Python, Ruby, Golang, something else. And let's say for this case, it depends on some uh, Debian libraries uh, that are not found uh, easily elsewhere. Uh, I want, in my organization, uh, let's say we have uh, a Debian infrastructure and we run everything on Debian, so it's easy to deploy. Uh, but in another institute, maybe a company or even a university, uh, for some reason they run SUSE and um, they don't want or they don't know how to build uh, all the additional libraries. So what can we do? Um, as well, maybe the dependencies don't change that often and two, twice or three times a, or four times a year. And what you really want in is when you're building and uh, shipping uh, your, uh, your software, you want to just to iterate on the code and you want to have um, a reproducible environment so uh, other people, colleagues, clients, whatever, they want uh, um, to run your software. In 2013, all this became possible with uh, Docker, uh, which po popularized the technology that existed uh, since uh, 2006 or seven, developed initially in Google, but then extended by all major tech companies. And uh, Docker provided a very simple uh, API and the, C uh, and the CLI utility that uh, people without being uh, Linux experts could interact with advanced the advanced concepts of uh, Linux, the Linux kernel that I will describe right after. Um, so what is a co container? Let's start from what isn't a container. Uh, in the Linux kernel, there is no such thing as a, as a container or something like a sandbox as we can imagine about Docker. It's more a uh, container describes like a, a Linux process that is uh, isolated using uh, some building blocks from the kernel, which are mainly control groups, namespace, and capabilities. And then some more advanced um, uh, concepts like uh, IC Linux, up armor, or second profile to isolate and do more fine grain, fine grained control of what your, uh, what the application, what the process in uh, Linux uh, can access to. And then these processes are running, um, are based on uh, Linux uh, container images that I will explain right after. Uh, apart from Docker, which started in 2013 and uh, changed uh, and introduced to a wider audience uh, these concepts, now we have uh, more concepts like uh, Cryo, Kata containers, or Podman. And uh, Docker has been. Uh, it has factored out one, um, a major uh, portion of the core functionality in the container D. A better image from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is this one that describes, this is only the container runtime uh, uh, part of um, the CNCF landscape. As you can see, like the standard thing is uh, container D that is backed by Docker. And then we have more uh, options like uh, Cryo that I mentioned and cut the containers and so on. Um, so I will do a quick demo to show how does this look like. Um, uh, so on the left that I will uh, maximize, uh, this is just a CentOS machine. Um, 
that has installed the Docker and Podman. And if we list some images with Docker, we can see that they have only CentOS 7. And now I'll show you how this actually looks on the file system. Um, oh no, before that, let's do better team. Uh, the control groups that I mentioned before. So on the right, that I will maximize. Um, this is uh, a demo application uh, that I forked from Liz Rice, which is one of the container experts uh, in this industry. Uh, so this is a very simple uh, Golang application, which is around 100 lines or, or less, um, that uh, starts a process uh, from a root file system and it does some uh, basic isolation uh, to, so, so we can check and test the concepts that I, I just mentioned. Um, so here we can see um, that uh, the main command has run and child um, uh, calls and methods. Um, so in the run method, um, we just take uh, the, the current process that we have with uh, from Proxel executable, and then we take the standard input and output and error and uh, pipe them to the new process that we want to run. And uh, here we set uh, some um, namespaces that we want. So uh, uh, one of the namespaces that we will uh, we are mostly interested in is the new namespace, uh, which is basically the mount namespace, but it's called the new namespace because in the Linux kernel we thought they would create only one namespace and they just call it new. And then we have uh, the PID namespace, which isolates uh, what processes can see uh, in the system, and the UTS namespace, uh, which, which controls um, um, a time and um, the, um, the host name uh, and things like this in, uh, in, in a process. And then we have also a child process that does almost the same. Uh, and additionally, it sets, it does a system call to set the host name of the process into container. And then it changes routes to uh, an Ubuntu system. Um, I, have also, I also have a, a Fedora file system to show you how quickly and easy to, to change. Also, uh, what we're going, what we're doing here with another system call is to um, not a system call, just to change directory to start uh, working on slash. But then we also mount uh, proc to be able uh, to see processes and um, uh, inspect what is going on in the system. But then after, right after, we also unmount uh, uh, proc uh, from the parent process so that uh, we are. Uh, completely isolated. Um, furthermore, uh, we will also set uh, a control group uh, limit for the um, PID um, in the PID namespace that we are, and the relevant line is this one that we will set the maximum uh, PIDs to 10. And as you can see, uh, uh, con control groups version one are managed by a sudo file system, which is under a CSFS uh, C group. Um, so let's go and run it. So this is a Golang application. So we can just run it uh, with, let me clear my screen first. Uh, so we will run with go run, and we will run the source code. And again, we will call run that we defined inside the code, and then we will just launch a shell. Um, as you can see, uh, we are in uh, the container uh, now, since we changed the host name to container, and we will list uh, which processes we can see. As you can see, I can see only uh, the bash, the child bash that I'm running, and PS uh, that I started, and uh, the current shell uh, that I'm working on. Um, I will exit, and if you check the actual system, you will see that I don't have only three processes, I have 120. Um, one of the most important concepts uh, of containers that uh, usually as developers uh, we take advantage from is uh, 
the mount namespace, which is the RTFS that I explained before. So if we go and change the mount, uh, the RTFS that I described before, uh, we can change from Ubuntu to Fedora. Ah, but before doing that, I will show you that, that was in, indeed in an Ubuntu machine. By cutting etc OS release. And here you can see that I was in a, in a bionic uh, system. Um, while at the moment, my actual operating system is as well uh, uh, bionic. But let's now go and change uh, to Fedora. So when you do Docker run uh, with um, with Fedora or Ubuntu, uh, the Docker daemon uh, in the in the background is doing something similar. So if I run it again and list and to show what is the release, we can see here that we are in a Fedora 32 image, and this looks like um, this in the file system just as a directory. This is the Ubuntu file system, and this is the Fedora file system that you can just go to the distro web page and uh, download. Okay, let's continue with the slides to go describe uh, images now because this was mostly about uh, containers and how they run and what actually Docker and other systems are, are doing in the background. So instead of having uh, just a tarball that you go to um, to the distribution website and download and uh, then unpack, uh, we have container images. Uh, so container images is a way of distributing software as tarballs. And I say tarballs because uh, we will talk about uh, layers. And uh, it could be one or more tarballs. And all the artifacts are dependencies are in these tarballs, which are then uh, downloaded to the a file system uh, of the host uh, that runs all our processes, then unpacked, and then the, um, the container, which is essentially a process, starts uh, on a thin writable layer on top of this file system. But um, I will just ex I will explain uh, how this looks like uh, exactly in a in a Linux box. So if we go back to the CentOS machine that I described. So this is uh, Webinar 2. And if we check, uh, is a CentOS machine. Um, so now in, the, in, this, uh, in this machine, I have installed Docker and Podman. And we can interact with Podman, with Docker, um, with the Docker CLI. So if I do Docker info, I can see uh, information about uh, my deployment, and specifically here, I can see that I'm running uh, an overlay to um, storage driver, which I will describe what it is, and the actual file system of my of my machine is um, XFS. So, if I list the images that I have available, you can see that I have um, a CentOS image. And uh, remember that uh, this is a tarball uh, that is hosted in an HTTP server. So if I want to inspect how this looks like um, uh, on this CentOS machine, I can do tree and I can list all directories in var lib docker. Um, var lib is a essential directory that Linux machines uh, hold state. And in var lib docker, I have overlay two that we inspected as a storage driver. And if I do three, I can see that I have my CentOS um, um, my, my CentOS image, and here I have a single layer, and in the diff directory everything is unpacked. And I can prove you that this is actually um, a CentOS machine because I can just list um, I can just cut what is stored 
in um, in this root file system, which is again CentOS Linux 7. The same applies for, for Podman. So it just changes the directory and it uses the same backend. So if we do three in um, in varlib containers, in storage, and in overlay images, we can see that again we have um, just one table and the only thing that changes is how uh, Podman extracts um, uh, the tarballs in the file system. So here are the are our tarballs. Um, and I can prove you that this is again a CentOS image by doing Podman images. And you can see that I have again the same CentOS 7 image, which if I list from Docker again, it's exactly the same image. So now moving back to the slides, uh, we described how does a, a container image looks like in the file system, but how we can get to, um, to those images. Um, the easiest way to start is um, from a Docker file and then uh, just defining which will be the base uh, file system that you will start. In this example that I will show you, it will, it's a Golang application and um, we will start from the Golang uh, base image and then I will show you the context that I have uh, for the build, which I will, I'm, I'm going to use the Docker engine uh, to produce the artifact. And here you can see that I'm just uh, downloading some dependencies, I'm copying my source code, and then I do my build and I'm defining um, how, what is the command that my, um, uh, that my, my container from this container image will start by default. So if I go back to my server to build, This is my uh, context directory. This is the Docker file that I described before, named Docker file single, and then I will explain what the other Docker file is. And this is my source code. The rest of the directories I will not use in the build, but they will be used as context. context. Uh, so this is a way uh, to do Docker build. As you can see in the Docker build, I'm passing the name of um, the image that I want to build and the tag. I specify which is the file, the Docker file that I want to use. Here I, I could omit this because the, just Docker file is the default one and dot is the context. My build has, was done already beforehand um, and we can inspect it, which is a go server 006. So if I do Docker images, you can see that I have 006. Oh, sorry, this is. I got ahead of myself and I showed you the optimized version. Uh, okay, L let's try to build it again. This time with Docker file single that I described before. I have done this build before as well. So now if I list again, you can see that I have a 006 build and it's 932 megabytes because it's based on Golang, which brings me to the to my next point, which was uh, just for a simple Go server application that uh, serves a very um, uh, small website or is just a REST application, it's very big. So let's go back to the slides, um, to the best practice of uh, image building. Um, what you, um, so, so having containers and then having its process running to its own root file system, what we want to achieve is also resource optimization. We don't want to have massive images like the one that I showed, which is 900 megabytes. So what we need to focus on is uh, reducing the size and we can do that by doing 
either multi-stage builds, which I will just show you right after, or having multiple build steps. Uh, so in my case, I could have just have built my binary uh, outside the container and then just add it, uh, add it back. But for convenience, uh, since uh, Docker uh, 117 or 118, I don't remember now, um, uh, the multi-stage builds were introduced where we could essentially build more containers that have intermediate steps. And the, the other important um, aspect of uh, building containers is image tags, where in the first slide we mentioned that um, we want our development and deployment environment to be reproducible. Um, so we want to have some semantic, we want to have semantic versioning or in any case, a meaningful versioning system. And we need these versions to be immutable because we can't uh, just use uh, version 006 one day and then the other day if we try to use it again in a different environment, in a different data center, um, uh, and that image, uh, uh, found that image changed. Okay, let's go back to our build environment and uh, tr try to build uh, instead of single uh, using um, the multi-state build, which we, we saw before. And now it's back again to 14 megabytes. So how did this happen? If we inspect the Docker file, uh, we see that before it was just from Colang and then it was just building and uh, adding the binaries. But in, uh, in this version, it uh, tags uh, the, the build environment as built. It uh, completes the build um, in the second to last line from the previous Docker file. But then it starts another build, which starts from an Alpine operating system this time. It just adds the binary and uh, as, a, as a command that we will start by, by default, it's uh, the binary we produced um, in the previous step. So since we have our container built, we can just go and run it now. Uh, let me check if it's running already. It's running, so I will remove it. So here, instead of small, I can just run what I built before. I can use the name and then append the tag. So what this command does, uh, this will start uh, our container in detached mode. It will name it server and it will expose uh, port 1400 because this is a REST API application. It will also start it as the user 1000 and it will pass uh, the current directory and especially the DB directory which contains credentials to our container. So then I start it and it returns just the UID, uh, the ID of uh, the container. And if I do PS to list my running containers, I see I have a one named server and that it listens uh, to port uh, 1400. And if I go and uh, curl it, in port 1400, and I have a path defined inside. Uh, okay. It's 14,000. localhost 001, you can see that it returns just a JSON uh, from the demo application that I have. Okay, so this is obviously not a very, let's say, it's not an optimized way uh, to run images. So the natural thing after, um, not natural thing, but as the ecosystem started to grow with Docker, where we moved from was uh, to Kubernetes. Kubernetes started in, that we have already talked multiple times in the series of webinars, um, as an orchestration engine that it was exclusively using Docker, now it uses more systems. 
uh, uh, more backends to run containers, but uh, we will forget this uh, for a moment. So what we're going to do is to take this container and uh, run it in a declarative way um, on this uh, on Kubernetes, which is a distributed system that runs that has many uh, worker nodes uh, called kubelets where containers are stored. So to run a service in Kubernetes, what you typically need is a is a controller to control the pods that the the containers that we want to run, which are included in pods, and the usual ones are either a deployment, which can, which can run many replicas in any of the nodes, or a daemon set that runs one replica in each node. Then we want to add a service, um, which uh, exposes traffic for this um, uh, application that we run on Kubernetes inside the cluster. And so other services uh, that potentially are running can connect it. And then to expose it to the outside, uh, one of the standard uh, ways is to use an ingress object, which will be backed by an ingress controller, and it will expose the traffic uh, outside the cluster. Alternative ways to run it is to use directly the port of the host or host network, but um, uh, this is not a very native way for Kubernetes and uh, requires uh, and it, it assumes that uh, your, um, um, your, your application will be tied to specific nodes. Uh, and uh, what we have also recently introduced in our cloud, and it can also be found in many clouds, is service type load balancer, uh, which, uh, uh, which receives traffic in a load balancer managed by the cloud, and then it directs it directly to the cluster. And what we also have in this example is a service monitor, which uh, Diogo will mention in next week uh, in the next series, um, um, in, in the next um, webinar of the series about how to expose metrics. So I will just, um, it, it will be there, but I will not uh, go through it. So let's go back to our application. So now that we have uh, this build, which is, uh, uh, Go server 006. I have also other versions that I'm running already. And you can see we will go in and inspect what is running, um, how to run it on Kubernetes. So, as you can see, I have uh, the deployment that I mentioned, a service, an ingress, and the service monitor. We will start um, from the deployment um, where um, inside it, I have um, um, just, uh, I request only one replica and uh, I, I can request as, my, as many as I want. And then I have uh, inside this replica only one container. The similar uh, parameter that I passed in Docker, which was to run as user 1000 uh, in Kubernetes can be passed with the security context to specify the user. And then similar to the control groups uh, that I mentioned already for, for example, uh, PIDs, we can also have resources, uh, soft and hard uh, uh, um, limits uh, for our processes. And in, uh, in this case, I request a minimum of 32 megabytes and maximum of 64 and uh, the corresponding values uh, for CPU. And I just start uh, my application um, as I did with Docker. Uh, furthermore, which is um, not exactly, um, we will not go through it in, in this presentation, is that um, to pass the secret, the passwords for my for the database, I create a Kubernetes secret and uh, which is mounted in the container uh, in the file system that it will start. Then uh, after the deployment, we want a service. So in this case, um, the service exposes uh, the port 14,000. I name it metrics in this case, uh, but uh, it's not only for metrics. Uh, it, can, it can have any name, but um, in this demo application, I also expose metrics. But the, the important part is that the protocol is TCP and the port is uh, 14,000. And then moving along to the ingress subject, um, you can see that I have 
uh, I, I define a host name. Um, in our case, I would register it uh, in the same DNS. And I, dis I chose uh, Go Server in place. And the path will be this And I want to expose from the Go Server in place service that I defined before, uh, or 14,000. This is already deployed in a cluster. And I will just show it to you um, how it looks like. Uh, you can see that I have just one pod that I requested, which is running like since an hour. And um, if I go and curl the host name that I deployed, I can see the exact same answer from uh, the, the, the container that I was running uh, in uh, my building machine. Uh, the reason is that they just point uh, to the same database. And I think this was all I had. I also have uh, just two references in the in Docker documentation, which uh, I strongly recommend uh, to have a look. Uh, it's uh, very extensive and uh, very thorough, but uh, if you start from get started, um, uh, it should uh, have plenty of information. Um, I think that's it for me. Uh, we can ask questions or we for uh, any of the concepts that I described or anything from the demo. Ricardo? Cool. Thank you, Chris. Um, I don't see any question in the Q&A, but uh, if someone wants to jump in, just uh, uh, write it now or, or just add, uh, raise your hand. You know, if there's any any specific uh, question on what was present, ah, there is one. Yeah, go ahead, Antonio. Uh, is there any case where multi-stage builds are actually not possible? Um, no, I wouldn't say there is any such case. The only requirement is uh, the builder machine to support it. In the case of Docker, if it's uh, newer than 1806, uh, it should be fine. And then there are other systems like Podman or Canico from Google that is used in GitLab uh, CI at CERN uh, that support it. So it's just uh, in the matter of uh, the engine. Okay, thanks. Okay, there's another question from Giacomo. I don't know, Giacomo, do you want, do you want to ask? Or... I gave you. Ah, yeah. No, I already by the state. Ah, okay, okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Ah. I, I didn't hear. I think he said uh, he clicked it by mistake. <laughs> ah, okay. It's <laughs> fair enough. So, uh, one, one thing that we can collect as well, I, I don't see any other question right now, but um, feel free to still raise your hand. But one, one thing that we can collect is uh, ask people what else they would like to hear about in this area and do like a, a, an advanced uh, version of this uh, where we can focus on things like, I don't know, SE Linux, for example, or uh, uh, pod security about, policies. About, yeah, pod security policies. Um, there will be one webinar on RPAC as well, uh, but maybe, maybe the lower level container um, features would also be interesting. Um, yeah, something like that. Okay, so I don't see any other questions, so feel free to ask in the usual places if you have some after, and uh, otherwise, thanks a lot, Spears. And uh, the recording will be available soon, as usual. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.